but again, welcome to this uh, next in the webinar series from ERISA, uh, GIS Professional Association. Um, I am Steve Steinberg, uh, the Geographic, Geographic Information Officer from LA County, and I'll be moderating today's session. And maybe just to give a brief bit of context, uh, the reason this came to be is uh, we got approached um, by USDR um, several months ago when the COVID uh, pandemic sort of was getting some uh, traction, for lack of a better term, um, through a former colleague who now works as a volunteer with USDR. Um, and I was intrigued by the opportunity that they present to support government organizations in responding to what is an unprecedented event. Um, like many organizations, um, while we have a large staff in the county um, and a lot of people that do technology, we didn't have uh, even at our level, the capacity to do everything that was being asked of us uh, easily. So I engaged with uh, USDR um, on a project in LA County, a fairly small one initially to work on uh, helping folks find Wi-Fi access if they didn't have home access and needed to get online for school or other work or just filling out paperwork and forms. Um, and I'm not gonna take time on that here, but just to say we did uh, with their help, put up a uh, Wi-Fi locator map that's available to residents and visitors of LA County to find Wi-Fi access points nearby. Um, since then, I found that they're actually working with a few projects in LA County and other departments, uh, not necessarily just GIS, but um, many of them uh, are just technology projects. So um, I've, on that basis, thought they were a really neat organization that we should share with others. So here we are. Um, and I know uh, people are zoomed out on a lot of these meetings, but we are recording this session. So it will also be available uh, for you or others to come back and view and share as well uh, a few days from now. So with that, um, let me introduce our, whoops, why is my PowerPoint not behaving? Let me introduce our speakers and get our, Oh, there we go. Um, so our speakers are from U.S. Digital Response. Uh, they're going to tell you a little bit more about the organization. Uh, you saw some in the webinar announcement, um, but the short, short version of the story is uh, they're a volunteer organization of technology professionals that are here to help government organizations uh, respond to COVID-19 and the many things that have been coming up out of that process. Um, our two speakers today are Raylene Young, um, who is uh, CEO for USDR, and Adam Fletcher, um, who is a volunteer with the organization and has actually worked on a project in Pennsylvania that uh, I think you'll find interesting because it does also have a GIS spin to it, um, and we are a GIS organization. Thanks so much for having us, Steve. Um, really excited to talk to this group. Uh, so as Steve mentioned, I'm the uh, CEO of USDR, um, which uh, I'll share a little bit about what we are and what we've been up to, and then hand it over to Adam. He'll talk a lot more about um, a project that he did that's more relevant to um, GIS and, and kind of probably the problems that you are all facing. So just to tell you all a little bit about um, US Digital Response. So we were first started in mid-March, right when I would say um, many states across the country were entering shelter in place. And it was started by um, a very small group of basically multiple, um, three former US Deputy Chief Technology Officers um, and myself. And kind of that combination was, and, and my background is, is all in the private tech industry. So what we did is we kind of came together in March behind a pretty simple idea. Um, we saw that a lot of government systems, um, and many things are just being, going to be overwhelmed by the nature of this crisis. And so the question and idea was, could we somehow find some way to coordinate really fast, um, effective, like volunteer powered help and put, put those people in touch with governments on the front line um, to help with the, the COVID-19 crisis? So, you know, we've seen uh, even in the early days, the pandemic has had a huge impact on systems that have gone far beyond just healthcare. Um, everything from, I love the example you gave in LA County of just helping people access the internet because working remotely or having remote um, access has become incredibly important. But we've also seen critical government systems be affected like uh, in areas such as voting, uh, where vote by mail is becoming increasingly important. 
um, to benefits access and the social safety net, uh, really of all kinds. You have small business administration loans, you have unemployment insurance, you have EBT and food security access. Um, all of these things have become just really strained and overwhelmed as, as people have had to um, shelter in place and businesses have closed. Um, at the same time, there's really no shortage of great technical expertise in the country, um, who I think in many cases are really ready and ex excited to help, but often just don't know how, how to kind of put their skills to use. Um, so that was our thesis. And, you know, really in a wonderful way, we saw that uh, there was something there. And within, um, I think within the first few weeks, we had thousands of people sign up to volunteer. Um, and in that same time, we were able to get, you know, a few dozen uh, projects underway and, and really have started um, deploying help. So that's what we've been doing since mid-March. Um, in terms of like how this works, uh, it's kind of simple. Um, a lot of things, almost everything we do uh, is, in, is done in direct partnership with people on the front lines or in government teams or organizations that support government services. And they, they write in, they get in touch for help. Um, we look for uh, the, you know, some volunteers that really meet those requirements. Um, we kind of sit on the USDR side to, to really carefully place and vet those volunteers. Um, and we really leave it to the government teams and the volunteers themselves to partner really closely and figure out what the right help looks like. Um, I'd say, uh, kind of as I mentioned, I think it's been working and I think we've really been blown away. Uh, to date, around um, over 5,500 volunteers have raised their hands to help. Um, and there's a wide range of skill sets from kind of all of the more classical technical skill sets around um, different front end, back end engineering, uh, product management, data science. But we also have very specialized volunteers. Um, I remember when uh, a few months ago, a lot of the unemployment insurance systems were really being slammed across the country. Um, a lot of those systems uh, are old mainframe systems uh, written, in, written in COBOL. And there weren't that many COBOL programmers in our volunteer database. But after a few weeks, or maybe even just a week of sending out a call for more help, we had hundreds of people sign up with that background. So something that's been really neat is just the breadth and range of the volunteers who have signed up um, and how willing everyone has been to help. How we engage, um, I mentioned, is, is kind of flexible depending on the need of the team that we work with. So we've done a lot of projects and I'll kind of talk to you about a few and they've looked like different models. So in some cases we've worked with, um, let's say a very, uh, you know, uh, tech, tech focused or kind of technically heavy team in government, um, in which case they have, you know, existing engineers, they have existing um, data scientists and so forth. And what they're looking for is a bit of this like surge support. So they, they have a roadmap, they have projects and they're saying, hey, can we find some volunteers to come pitch in on these really urgent time sensitive projects? And it's really more like a staffing and partnership model there. We've done a, a great example of that is working with the New Jersey um, innovation team where we've just kind of continuously partnered with them on a variety of projects they've been doing for COVID. The second area is sometimes we just find the right tools. Um, I think, you know, unsurprisingly, a lot of the problems that we see, um, there are existing off the shelf SaaS tools or products out there that work really well. And what we're in a position to do is help survey kind of what tools are out there, we'll evaluate them and we'll even help a government team kind of get, up, get them up and running. Um, a great example of this is a lot of government teams and offices have had to move to remote work for the first time. And so their own workflows internally might rely on paper or you know, they had um, multi-step processes that were kind of like done in person or through manual review. And we were able to help their own IT departments sort of evaluate what tools were out there that they could use for um, docu digital document collaboration, signing and so forth. So we've done a lot of work to just help offices modernize. And the same applies to real world process, not real world, but like processes or services that affect residents. Like um, we have some conversations going on right now with, with courts and court systems around jury selection or um, just even the, what does it look like to operate a court in, in a remote environment. Um, and finally, we do build things. Um, in some cases, we, and I'll give a few examples as well, we've found that, you know, we find this problem um, and nothing really exists out there already that kind of meets the exact needs. Um, and so what we'll try to do is build something that can work for the immediate problem. We'll try to do it quickly, but we also try to build it in a very open source and extensible manner. Um, one other thing that we learn and we see is often 
a lot of the government teams that we work with across the country are facing very similar problems. So, um, and actually Adam, maybe we'll talk a little bit about this, but we'll often have, you know, we'll come into one city or county and state and we say, hey, oh, okay, the problem is, you know, we're thinking about how do we enable connecting like local food suppliers with, um, and, and they maybe have an excess or are able to provide low cost uh, food with like families that need food, right? So there's this kind of problem, this like matching problem that we'll actually see in like three or four cities or states across the country. And so where we sit in the middle is we'll think, okay, what is a kind of cheap or free uh, open source tool that we can actually build and then deploy to each of the places that are experiencing the same problem? And, you know, as a result, we get kind of faster and faster with each example of the same problem that we see. Um, and we get, you know, a little bit better at helping. I should also emphasize, actually, all of everything we do is provided totally free to all of our government partners. Um, and everyone's a volunteer. So the benefit there is, um, you know, we're very kind of technology and vendor agnostic. Like, we're really here to just find the best solution, ideally the cheapest and free solution that we can. Um, so I'll give a few examples. Uh, one example is it's a little bit um, wonky for kind of those who, who think about uh, spending reports and grants, but um, this came out of, uh, I think obviously the CARES Act has had a huge impact on governments and government services. Um, in, a, in a great way, it's, it's unlocked a lot of funds, but it's also created a lot of confusion. Um, it's a new class of, of grants and funds. It also ties to a lot of benefits that are related to the pandemic. So um, pandemic specific unemployment insurance access or um, kind of uh, EBT and, and food stamp access. And so this creates a lot of burden actually on, on the states to identify um, what grants are eligible for this benefit to actually kind of report and track um, on spending. And ultimately just there's a lot of like work that has to be done, logistical work has to be done. And, and we saw this as all of this friction and this work is kind of getting between um, this, the government teams and their ability to actually access these funds, which ultimately, you know, they're, they're deploying to residents in need. Um, so this was, I thought, a really interesting project. And, and similarly, every state across the country is doing the exact same thing um, and sort of making sense of these federal funds. So what we did um, is made a free uh, tool. It's all in our GitHub repo. You can look at the source code um, that enables states to um, basically do this. And the neat thing is um, what you're seeing is it's a lot of very specific things to CARES grant reporting, but you have your uh, you have to report, you know, what type of COVID program you're using it for. Um, is it a you know, loan? Is it benefits? Um, what type of grant it is? And so you actually have to just fill out all these complicated things. Um, and what's neat is what we're looking at is Rhode Island. Um, because of the way that we build these tools and the way we make them available to everyone, we're, we not only have kind of this general platform, but we're able to do custom work for each state that needs it. So Rhode Island was our first kind of partner on this. And so they, they're using it to track their grants, but we're already in conversation with um, a few other states and can do the same thing for them. So that's kind of a, a common pattern of our work. Uh, and then kind of the next one is, oops, let's see, is a bit different um, and kind of just shows you a little bit of the breadth. I would say this one is actually very uh, resident focused. I think a big pattern we've seen from COVID response is how much is happening at the community level. And I think something that's also really special is just, um, you know, communities helping each other, neighbors helping each other. So this is one of our earlier projects um, called Neighbor Express. And it was really motivated by hearing from um, one city in California, one mayor, uh, the mayor of Concord, California, who reached out and, and um, was, the problem they were having is they knew there were all of these um, homebound senior citizens uh, in their city that needed food. and at the time, it was just, how are they supposed to go to the grocery store? A lot of these things just weren't figured out and um, it, it seemed really dangerous for them to do so. So the idea was, could we have um, younger, like mobile, like uh, people who weren't at risk actually go pick up those groceries and deliver them to their neighbors? And it was really important to do this in a local, in a local way because you want people to kind of just go in their neighborhood and deliver food. So what we did is we built a tool for this. Um, and we launched it in the city of Concord um, at this point in March. And since then, we've adapted it for multiple other cities, including others in California, one in New Jersey. Um, and in the same pattern, it's open source, it's all free. Um, we've even had, we've even seen a city in Canada adopt it on their own and use it for the same purpose. Um, but the neat thing is uh, we really try to make it kind of like 
really easy to use for people. I think this is an example where the audience for this tool is a very non-technical audience. So it might be um, the local department on aging and, and, and health services um, where they may not have technical backgrounds. So we wanted to make it really easy for people to customize. So here's just an example where not only did we build the tool, we built a pretty um, kind of self-serve content management system. So if you're the administrator of this program in Patterson, New Jersey, um, you can actually customize all the text and, and determine all the different rules that you'd want to follow uh, when matching volunteers. Um, and yeah, this is this was great. Just or very early on, this program was done in partnership with Meals on Wheels too, and so it just had um, it just really had this like strong community feel and impact. So. With that, um, I'll actually turn it over to um, Adam, but just to frame this a little bit, um, I guess I should say, you know, uh, I've given you a bit of a flavor on benefits and data, and I'll kind of say that in the end, we've ended up doing um, engagements in like several different topics. Um, I'll let Adam talk about the data, because I think that's been really interesting and, and most relevant for this audience. Um, but, he, you know, him and his team have done things with automated data collection, kind of building better dashboards. Um, and, and this has touched a variety of, of like subject problems, like uh, everything from looking at contact tracing or um, uh, homelessness, uh, su support for the homeless uh, people experiencing homelessness and so forth. But we've also done projects in um, a lot of benefits, as I mentioned, just communication with constituents. So helping uh, states and counties and, and cities better like communicate what are the latest shelter in place guidelines? How do you communicate those things at scale? At scale? We've helped a lot with uh, moving previously offline processes, processes online. Uh, we talked about these marketplace and matching things. Um, but really we, we're starting to think in month four now of our existence um, that, that we're really responding to a variety of crises at, at the same time. I think it's not just the COVID crisis, which has had acute impact on healthcare, testing and, and thinking about reopening businesses. There's also the economic crisis, which touches that social safety net. There's the voting and election crisis, I think that we're in, we're just trying to learn how to uh, administer and support voting um, in this new time. There's the government fiscal crisis, I think, as we see a lot of budgets are, are, are gonna have, um, are just gonna come in a lot lower than they have maybe in a very long time. Um, and we really think about how do we kind of save costs and time for government employees. Um, and then also the policing and incarceration crisis, I think we're seeing right now. Um, and we're, we're trying to partner as well with um, some police uh, departments and, and nonprofit organizations that think about how to use data um, and technology and analysis to, to make better decisions um, in, in policing and incarceration. So there's a lot going on. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to um, Adam. Yeah, so thank you, Raylene. Thank you, Steve. Um, I am Adam Fletcher. I am the CEO and co-founder at a company called Bit.io, but what I love to do is data stuff. And uh, when I got reached out to from Raylene and from a friend of ours, uh, Tiffany and Jessica Cole and a few other people that work with USDR, um, they had mentioned that there was a USDR group called RT COVID Status that really was focused on data, right? And this was my sweet spot. So I loved getting involved. And what we what we focus on at RT COVID status is really the whole life cycle of data, recording, ingestion, transformation, analysis, reporting. And we really, we present this triangle here, um, this pyramid here, like Maslow's pyramid, if you will. And, uh, and, and sort of showing at the bottom that data collection is the critical foundation for everything we end up doing. And then in fact, a lot of cases where, where we help out most is in the data collection portion, the normalization and ingestion. There's a lot of tools out there that all the great GIS tools do the, the visualization side of it. Um, and working with RT COVID status, we came up with a few key tenants, right? We want to go where the data is, is good or we want to help make it good and good meaning that it's useful, it's actionable. Um, we have ways to get it. We can help or we can help people get it. Um, and we also firmly believe that delivering value as soon as possible is critical, especially in the case where we have something like COVID going on where it's an acute crisis where we need to deliver value right away um, because it's time sensitive, because it, people's lives depend on it, et cetera, right? Like we really want to be, the RT is real time in the real time COVID status, right? We want to be there right away. So we're, we're sort of a strike team that comes in, but we come in and we listen. We don't, you know, we've, we found a lot of groups, especially out here in Silicon Valley that like to kind of push an agenda or a, a solution on people. We listen to see what the issue is that people need 
uh, solving. We actually really like to spend you know some time talking to people on the front lines and saying, you know, what is miserable about your day? Like what what is taking up all your time that is a technology problem that we can come in and just solve, right? Um, that said, we also find ways to we sort of have learned to design for success in our government engagements, right? One thing that can happen often is you get engaged at the wrong level or you get engaged with the wrong person who, who can't actually push the solution through or can't make give you the access you need or doesn't really have you know quote unquote the juice right so uh, that's one aspect and then and then obviously it's also not getting uh, getting carried away in feature creep right everyone wants to design the perfect solution to all of the problems and the, and the real answer for what we do and what we're careful about doing in our two COVID status and in USDR, I think, is we, we get our scoping right, clear and tight scoping, so we can we can focus on outcomes and deliver them and be, have successful engagements, right, and build off that as a foundation. Um, and finally, it really is about not putting a burden on anyone. We actually want to take the burden away. And so if we come in and make people learn a whole bunch of new tools or we come in and we, we push an agenda on you that is, uh, that's outside the scope and ability or outside the, the you know, the the, the goal of the organization we're, we're engaging with, that's not useful. So we really need to get out of the way. We want to make the frontline workers, uh, we want to make lives better. We don't want, you know, to say like, oh, you have to switch over to this awesome new framework because it's a new framework. Like we don't do that. We come in and we, we come to you. Um, so I want to talk uh, in depth here about Pennsylvania's data needs. In particular, uh, this is where I spent a lot of my time in engaging it over the past two or three months. Oh my God. Uh, uh, so Pennsylvania got in touch with us, um, and they, they were actually fairly advanced. I think if you look across all the states and, and look at what they're doing for their data, uh, especially around hospitals, COVID cases, PPE resources, those sort of things, um, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty variant across all the states. What Pennsylvania was doing and doing very well is mandating the report of all of their COVID available case data and resource availability per hospital. So every hospital in the state of Pennsylvania requ is required to report those statuses every hour uh, to a central location. Right? This was mandated very early on in, in the COVID and some of it was I think even pre-COVID. Um, and this has actually been a tremendous advantage for the state of Pennsylvania. That alone gave them their sort of that, that base of the pyramid, their underlying are we getting the data was, was strong, right? They had a good foundation. Um, they also had a great sort of tip of the pyramid and, and, and their ArcGIS team was fantastic and they were doing all these wonderful visualizations that the governor was using for, for decision making, you know, at, at, and was really driving all of the, the decision making around COVID. Um, the only the issue with Pennsylvania and where we came in was they were missing the middle layers, right? The ingestion, the transformation, the normalization. Um, here, and, and you're not meant to read the stuff on the right, this is just an example that there's a lot of data fields they were ingesting, right? This is the kind of a sample of what PA data looked like. They had every kind of, you know, they had every kind of thing around beds, occupied, you know, occupied, not occupied, all really quite interesting stuff like pediatric, adult, ICU, things you didn't think about, right? Like, oh, you can repurpose these beds to respond to an emergency. Um, Ditto with a few other things that I, I would just not have thought of on the first pass, which is like, who's sick? Like, which employees are sick? You know, uh, how many suspected COVID cases I thought was an interesting one. This all worked out to be about 170 columns per hospital um, per hour with uh, 290 or so hospitals uh, reporting that data. I'm not accurate about the number of hospitals and that's intentional. I'll go into that in a moment. So that data is great, high impact data, as I said. Uh, but it was not up to date. The, the data was coming into the main data store every hour, but getting that into GIS was a manual process done by the GIS engineers in Pennsylvania. Um, and they would have to manually pull that from the SFDP site. They would literally open those files in Excel, move columns around because ArcGIS's CSV, Common Separate Value Importer, had bugs uh, relative to the CSV that was output from Excel. So they have to move all these columns around to make sure they didn't get corrupted. And then after cleaning the data up, they would upload it into ArcGIS. They'd have to rename a bunch of things inside ArcGIS and then publish the dashboard. So while the source data was coming in every hour, the actual GIS dashboards were only updated maybe three times a day, but that took like an hour or two every update. And so, you know, and it was miserable because the GIS engineers who were doing this, this is not the, the their value is not in opening Excel and transforming columns around. Like that's not why these people are, you know, these are highly skilled GIS engineers. They should be doing analysis. They should be 
creating new dashboards to show you. They should be uh, creating insights, right? So we we key on this, right? Like manual, that's a magic word for us, right? RT COVID status is like, oh, manual technical process? We can automate that, right? That's a that's wonderful place for us to exist, right? We can fix manual process with software, right? Because a manual process is just repetition that hasn't been automated yet, right? It means we're purely adding value. We're not, we're not pushing a new tool. We're not doing anything. What we're going to do is get rid of a chunk of work you have to do and have a computer do it silently and automatically, right? And computers are great at this. This is what they should do. They should do repetitive tasks over and over again. And also automation is often one of those tasks that's outside the mandate um, in, in government or elsewhere because it's like, it's boring work. It's not about delivering results. It's not like, it's very hard to ask, you know, your boss or maybe even the governor to say like, great, yeah, can I have a week to automate away some stuff though well, and not give you new data? But the answer is no, but you can't do that, right? Um, and so this is a great area for, for RT COVID status to jump in and say like, look, we'll do that while you keep working on the frontline stuff. We will get out of your way and make your lives easier. And so, so we did this. Our challenge was, right, great, we got these hourly CSVs. That's awesome. Uh, but the source of those CSVs, uh, that data is dirty and changes constantly. So the column names changes, which is bad because that's our that's what we often key off, right? Um, but the semantic value, semantic meaning of those columns doesn't change, just the names, right? Fields get added, they get removed, right? Um, location and name data was wrong for a lot of hospitals. I mean, you've probably seen this, right? Like, jazz is great, but man, if you have the wrong lat, lat long, like, it doesn't know what to do about that. I can't guess. Um, and that was often the case. We had, you know, hospitals nominally in Pennsylvania show up in the Arctic, right? Like that's not great. Um, no accurate county information. Actually, this is like a big gap from the source of the data. They're literally telling us what, they wouldn't tell us what county. And you say, county, man, like that's, that's easy. Just go look it up. That is not actually as easy as you think. The hospital's addresses can span counties. The mailing address can be in a different county than the actual, you know, address the physical location of the hospital. Um, hospitals change addresses pretty often because one wing of a hospital is in County A, and another wing is in County B, and they decide that, well, now we're in County B, right? Like, but we want to still say we are the hospital in County A. Uh, this happens over time a lot. Um, uh, we ran into some bugs in ArcGIS, right? Like, their ArcGIS is CSV, Common Separated Value Handler, cannot handle apostrophes in our in headers this is i mean csv doesn't really have a standard but this is something that should be able to handle even if you wrap them in quotes if you do all these workarounds that you would you know as many stack overflow tabs as you want to have open there's just no answer for this aside from we take in the csvs we throw away all the apostrophes and we move them on into gis um you can see on the right a little bit of me uh, my commit log here of dealing with all the hospital name changes and, and updates um there is no accurate list in the well there is now and i think it's in our github repo of all the hospitals names and locations in pennsylvania um the not none of the government organizations have it none of the city organizations have it none of the state organizations have it they all have different views of that because some facilities are federal some aren't some are temporary hospitals that came up for covid some are renames of other things some share the same code that is used by um you know the government some don't some like there's all of these the data is filthy and you know sometimes you just have a lat lounge and you go and you look on google maps and you you see that like it's this hospital and then you see there's like 10 other entries with reviews and you wonder why and it's like oh they changed their name or they got bought right in fact over the course of these two months where we worked with with the last two months several hospitals literally got bought changed their name and had we had to update the data to do that to reflect that but we had to preserve the fact that it had historical data at the same hospital and so what seems like an, an easy problem and these are the things that you know the folks in the gis team in pennsylvania they don't necessarily this is shouldn't be what they deal with like we should deal with this they should get good clean data so they can work on gis and this is an area where i think usdr and in particular rt covid this is sort of what we specialize in coming in and fixing but what we don't specialize in is arcgis or gis <laughs> We actually, I actually, and, and uh, had no experience with GIS before this, right? This world was new to me. Um, and like, I didn't know like in GIS, a row in a table is called a feature, right? Like this is like something you're all probably laughing at me, but like literally I, I had no idea, right? Um, 
we also had some other challenges aside from ignorance of GIS, which is the actual source of the data, this place called Knowledge Center in Pennsylvania. Um, they, we would ask them and say, okay, can you change the schema, for example, to get rid of these apostrophes that will make everyone's life easier. And they, they couldn't do that or they wouldn't do that for various reasons. You know, they have their own workload and so on. Um, and of course, the, the ever evolving climate we were in around COVID and our understanding of COVID and our understanding of what was important for COVID uh, meant that the data changed. And that, that's fine. That's perfectly, that's what data does. It changes, right? Like I think if you come in to work with data and you have a fixed mindset about what the data will be, you're going to fail because it, it will always change. People are the source of those things. They change, they're in, you know, they add new things, they get new insights. And of course, as you improve things, as, and I'll talk about this in a moment, more things are wanted from you, <laughs> right? The usual, the sort of millstone of success that hangs around your neck later. Um, now, we did have some advantages. We, for instance, we know data programming automation, like we're good at that. Like that stuff we are really good at. Um, the lead GIS engineer over in Pennsylvania, Carrie uh, Chapasso, is awesome. And, and she could teach us all the GRPS we need. In fact, she did a great job of doing so. She would make videos of what she was doing. She would show us the transformations she was walk, working through, right? Um, and give us those videos and we could use those as a reference and then we could get out of her way while we, while we had this reference material to work with to understand ArcGIS, which was fantastic. Um, and of course, like any progress is a big win and that, that's the, the, the way we approach things, the way USDR approaches things, the way RT COVID is. You know, we want that to be the case because every, because then it, it, it's fuel for us to keep going. It's fuel for the partners of ours to keep working with us, right? Also, we're really good at finding things on the internet. So we know how to like go get those hospital days. We know how to use like Google Maps to get the lat launch that's wrong and fix it and things like that and build the, to those APIs. Um, also, we know how to use the cloud. Like we built the, the solution we built, which I'll talk about in a moment, uses Google Cloud Platform. And, and by knowing, by, in a, by being able to work with this and do this with very low friction, it's not like we have to go through the bureaucracy of the government to do it. That, that actually was a very powerful advantage for us. It was able to build the solution quickly. So what did we end up actually building, right? So we built some Python scripts that went and downloaded the, that data from that uh, SFDB site, the data provided in Knowledge Center every hour, right? Then we trans we would transform all that data in a bunch of different ways um, into a format that ArcGIS could parse, which is really CSV, but CSV cleaned up for the to the to the peccadillos of the ArcGIS CSV ingester. Um, we'd up upload this into ArcGIS uh, automatically. That was an adventure learning about have the different ways to overwrite and append and do things like that. And we trigger all of this every 15 minutes via Google Cloud Platform. And, and this actually ended up working great, right? This is sort of an example of, we have this trigger event that comes in and, and processes it. Um, this was very successful. We ended up powering, this automation allowed the ArcGIS folks in PA to build the public facing PA dashboard and launch it, which should count to level rollups within the first week. They had 13 million views of that. Um, from everybody in Pennsylvania, and I think still it's averaging more than a million views uh, a day. Um, and then this, this of course, let them build all sorts of new dashboards, um, including stuff to help with homelessness and food hung food scarcity and, and a bunch of other things. Um, like I was saying, being successful means that you know people want more things from you, which is fantastic. That's what we're here for. Like. I love it when that happens because it means we were we we deliver value and now there can be more value to get. Um, so we did. We added more things. We we built a whole historical database. They did not have the GIS folks did not have a historical database in ArcGIS of all of the data, so we couldn't see trends over time because of the, the this was really because of the complications of the data being messy and dirty and not having it. Well, we cleaned up all the old historical data and imported it our same scripts. And this let them see the trends over time and make better decisions about where uh, the progress of COVID response in PA was going. Um, and we could add some summary tables and county level, and we could summarize a whole bunch of different things. We also started working on their long-term care facility data, which is basically you know, hospitals, but slightly, slightly different format, slightly different desire out of it. Um, and also, as I said, we could automate a, some of the summaries of the impact on the needs of food insecure PA residents. How much was COVID impacting those who need, who are food insecure? Um, and those are great, right? Like that's that's an area where they had no visibility, they had no dashboards, they had no way to see that. And now they can apply the government resources, the state resources to help those folks out. What did we learn? I mean, I think we learned a lot of things. We 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 as a team in RT COVID, and I think as and, and brought back to USDR, right? 
Um, one of the things, you know, in government engagement, you really got you got to find the problem before you start building. Um, it's really easy out here in Silicon Valley to say like, I can build something cool and just start building it, but you're not, but not solving any particular problem. Like you just built for the sake of building. And I mean, look, that's fun. I do that on weekends for fun projects, but it is not useful to anyone. <laughs> Right. And so it's actually a lot like running a startup. You, you, you know, you want to be solving an actual problem. Like you have to provide value. Um, getting buy-in was also another thing. We, we felt uh, we actually had some engagements where we just didn't have buy-in from our people and like they sputtered out one network. Right. Um, and solving the immediate real problem. Like it's related to the first one, but it's, it's the immediate problem, not just a problem. You have to solve the problem that, you know, people actually have today. Um, right. And then, you got to deliver on it. You got to have good customer service. You just because you know you you have to, to 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 care and be thoughtful about the people you're working with and interacting with. And of course, you want to you know your job is to lose your job. <laughs> we want to come in, fix this problem, and never see it again, and and move on to other newer jobs. Um, and eventually, you got to you do have to do handoff. You do have to do a bunch of things. We're still in the middle of crisis, so we obviously haven't done that yet. But we will eventually need to hand off the technology we built. It's all open source. It's all available, but we're currently, you know, hosting some of the, the operational infrastructure and we need to, to get the hand it off. Um, and then some lessons on building and scaling our volunteer team, right? We, we focused on very small teams. I think we had very independent in working groups. This is in, inside RT COVID status. I'll talk about some of the other engagements, but they were relatively, relatively empowered small groups of people. Um, you know, we tried to keep, keep everyone motivated, keep the technical folks really shielded from any sort of bureaucratic things that came up, you know, and having one or just one or two bridges, um, you know, respecting people's boundaries during this time, like, you know, it's hard, right? Like you got your own life, you got things going on. We're not trying to put too much of a burden on you that if you are like emotionally or you're just, there's just your life's overwhelmed, that's fine. Do a good handoff, move on. Um, where are we going? I think, I think, one of the things we really would love to do is use some of the data architecture for other states that have this, that have uh, ingestion needs. I mean, I don't know about how LA is doing, but we could talk about it. Um, there's a lot of things like this. The The other thing though, is we didn't, we didn't set out to build a platform for the solution. We, we were okay with building a bespoke solution for Pennsylvania because our goal was to help them, right? Like the goal was a good outcome, not build a platform, right? over time that evolved such that we think we could reuse it in places, but if we can't, that's okay, right? The goal was to help Pennsylvania and help the COVID response there. Um, but what we can do is pull out the things that were valuable and repeatable. We can distill all the best practices and talk to other locations, right? We can talk, we can, we can contribute to, and we are contributing to sort of saying like, when and if there's another crisis like this, what are the good things that, that we learned from Pennsylvania's engagement or the, all the other engagements USDR is doing or RT COVID is doing that we can bring to a response playbook in the future, right? For medical emergencies, like large scale like this. Um, and then how do we trans transition the technology off, right? Um, this got some nice press, one thing to say, and you know, like I said, millions of people using it, which is fantastic. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about some of the other engagements we're doing um, before before we wrap this up in, in a moment. But uh, RT COVID again, we focus on data stuff, so we've we've been we've been reaching out to anyone who has data that needs to be cleaned or organized or presented or whatever. Right? Um, we're working with the city of New York for their to do predictions on uh, their personal protective equipment supply and demand. We we can kind of show how where in the pipeline all the PPE is, so where they're. You know, if they're getting a shipment of N95 masks, where is that? When does it hit? Who should you have it allocated to? Um, another one, the city of New York, the, the hotels, what they do for isolation. Um, we're doing some encampment tracking and uh, homeless encampment tracking in the city of Oakland. Um, another one in Riverside for the impact of this all on businesses. Another one in Santa Clara for contact tracing. I mean, just all of these places have data issues that they, they need help with, right? Um, and we're very, very happy to jump in. The New York in particular, like I, I sort of gave a quick overview of this, but, um, you know, we brought them, we helped with them, I mean, I should say we helped with them, really helped them to compare the total supply, of, you know, PPE stuff and projected demand, right? Like, and that actually lets them manage their response and plan their resource, resource allocation much, much better. Um, this is actually, they, they had no way to know this. So I think this was a, a great engagement. Um, here's an example, uh, some 
cleaned up example of what this dashboard looks like. Um, this is early in May. Um, but you can kind of see that we give them a good feedback on the balance and we can kind of tell them where their emergency is. They can quickly look at this and say like, oh man, we really need to worry about, you know, N95 masks, right? And sanitizing wipes versus, you know, face masks that are fine. Um, Ditto in Oakland, it's a largely like who's impacted, where should NGOs go, where should the city government go to help out? And this was a web location that actually you can use your phone very easily. This lets you sort of schedule a whole bunch of different groups to help coordinate a response. You know, we have a lot of volunteers right now in the, in, in, in the COVID response in the world, not just obviously in USDR, but everywhere. And, and, and you want those effectively deployed and, and this app helped in Oakland to do that. And here's, a, here's sort of an example of it. Who's visited where, when, and how. So how do we how do we request assistance? I might pass this actually over to Raylene. Um, yeah. So thanks, Adam. I think I always learn more when I hear all the things your team has been doing. It's it's kind of uh, I think one thing that just is sort of um, surprises me every day when this work is just how much um, these volunteer teams have been able to get done just in a few weeks and months. Um, so in terms of requesting help, it's pretty simple. Um, a lot of information is on our website at usdigitalresponse.org. And really the process starts by you, you fill out a web form um, and you kind of include information around the types of things you're looking for help with uh, and um, uh, basic information around like who, who's the best contact, like how to reach you. Um, and within hours, we will kind of triage those requests and reach back out. And the first step is really we just try to get on a call with, you know, someone like Adam and you'll just kind of get on the call and we'll ask you what you're going through and find ways to help. Um, so that's really the, the kind of easiest way to get in touch. Um, and if you're ever unsure, we also just have a kind of catch all inbox at info at usdigitalresponse.org. So that's it. Thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you both uh, Raylene and Adam. And if you wanna pass me back control, um, we do have, I'll start with the question that was put in the question box and others, if you have them, feel free to add. Um, uh, Zan asked, you mentioned clear and tight scoping being among your tenants, especially in these tense times. Do you have any advice to share on how to effectively respond to or manage scope creep without discounting the request of the requester? So uh, if you both probably have answers for that. I don't know if, if Raylene, you want to start with the general USDR answer and I can talk about the RT COVID answer. Sure. I, I would say in general, um, I think we seek, it's more sequencing for us than like saying it's not on the table. So I think what we try to do is just try to get to the first useful yeah. thing <laughs> and we focus on that. And it's kind of similar to Adam's story. It's like, we'll do that first and then we kind of pick up more work. But um, yeah, what would you say, Adam? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think the minimally viable product is the thing. You know, when we talk, I think I think then there's there's like the pre-solution, like when we're just starting the engagement answer about tight scoping, where it's like, of course, those conversations can can be very broad and can talk about the very like the impact of what the solution is bringing or like what the outcomes we want are. Um, it's then when we do the decomposition into the what is the first very first thing that will give you value is where we can bring that tight scoping, where we can say. You know, New York didn't say like, well, we, we New York just said, well, we, we don't know how much PPE we have coming, right? Like, and that's obviously a very broad and, and problematic thing. And we, we can come with them and say like, okay, great. Do you have the data? You know, it does the data live anywhere? Do you have a problem getting the source data? Is that the issue, right? You kind of, you kind of ask these leading questions where you say, you find out where their real problems are. And in Pennsylvania, you know, our, our initial engagement with Pennsylvania actually started with, with us, you know, saying, we'll make you a cool dashboard, right? Like, how wrong was that? They had a cool dashboard. They had ArcGIS. They don't need us to make a neat visualization, right? That wasn't like our value add. And through the, the conversation about that, what we did was we, you know, we listened to what they had in place. We asked them questions about what data there was. And we asked a lot of questions. And when we sort of used our experience to key off a few key, key yeah, we keyed off keywords, <laughs> um, such as we manually do X, right? Like, like I said, I highlighted that word for a reason. I think that helps us do that narrow scoping where we say like, okay, we're hearing all of these things. This is your outcomes you want. These are your problems. Where we can first engage and have an easy win within a time frame of like X, like within a week, we can give you automation of the knowledge center data into ArcGIS, right? That's what we can do in a week. 
here and, and, and then it kind of reframes the goal to be very narrow and it doesn't discount the requester's desire you know because it's still on the 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 what we want from an outcome um you know we are working in service of that outcome we can say like and then after that we'll reevaluate where that gets us towards your desire to have like an always up to date dashboard right um and and so it's really about that minimally viable scoping and, the, and, and some of the tricks are, are similar if you've ever worked in software it's very similar to saying things like you know what is going to happen in this sprint so to speak what's going to happen in the next week by, by putting a time bound on it you force a discussion about narrow goals um, and that's one of the tricks you use you can use a bunch of different things like that to kind of help get down to the minimally viable first deliverable and that's often like a very good way to show the progress and and bring tight scoping um, and really you're just scoping down to like a time frame versus a specific outcome but that's okay because you're, you're still working in the progress of that, that overall goal no, thanks. That's a great answer. Um, I had a, a little bit different question that I'll throw out. And, and as I'm talking, if others have questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A. Um, so obviously you started, as you said, Raylene, as a response to the COVID crisis back in March. Um, and while I'd like to hope this will be over soon, um, it's probably not. But uh, do you have sort of a longer term vision for USDR? Is this just going to last as long as COVID? Or are you going to spin this into the future? Um, and I'm thinking some of the examples Adam brought up in particular, homelessness and you know some of these other sorts of workflows, they are certainly exacerbated by COVID, but they're not, they're not exclusively COVID problems. So what's the future of USDR beyond COVID? Yeah, and it's a, it's a great question. I think there's a couple, couple things that you touched on that I agree. I, I, think, I think for one, even, what we see as the COVID crisis, I think it is not ending in months. I, I think there's actually a long, there will be a long period of time before we can really think about full recovery and the vaccine and, and all of that. So I do think even for COVID specific things, um, the work is not going in a way, away. And we are thinking a lot about how to just set up to be able to keep responding a, as we need to. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, I mentioned that we this work has, I think, kind of, um, more like brought attention to a lot of systemic issues and ongoing crises like i think the homelessness yeah. crisis in, yeah. in especially in california it is a real ongoing long-standing crisis and so as we've kind of been brought into these different projects we see that this work has a long has a long um has a long time that can, we can spend on it so we're kind of thinking about how do we situate like set up ourselves to, to do to keep doing that work and support it um and I think the other thing is, uh, I guess, another piece is we're starting to, um, because we started off as a response org, so we got requests and we did work, uh, it was very like, as things came in, we would put people on them, we would learn. But now we have um, many volunteers who've done multiple projects in specific areas. I think of RT COVID status as a great example where just as an organization, we now know a lot more about these, the same types of problems, like the different shapes and the, the fields that government teams are, are experiencing. So we're also thinking about how to specialize in more areas so that, you know, we actually can kind of like proactively offer more help in these areas versus just sort of um, just being a response org. Great, thanks. Um, and then I know we're running low on time here. We have another question in the, the question box. Um, and let me sort of try and summarize this one. Uh, it says, uh, it sounds as if USDR is well positioned to help geospatial response to natural hazards, especially during the pandemic. Hurricane evacuations, for example, will be approached very differently, or out west, wildfires, and so on. Do you see those kinds of things in the future, or have thoughts on that? I hope. Uh... I hope we don't see a lot of those specific things, but um, but yes, I, I would say we're here to help, and I think that's the thing. I guess with um, one thing we try to get across to everyone is like we never want anyone to self censor when they ask for help. I think better to just reach out and see if we can do something, um, and that's kind of how we've ended up doing a lot of the projects that we have. Is just a government team has reached out and thought, "Hey, could you help with this?" And usually we can find some way to help. Yeah, and I think I just to echo a little bit about that. One, one thing I would say here is one one thing we didn't have a lot of, and I mentioned this in my slides when when we started the PA engagement is we didn't have a lot of GIS or ArcGIS information, you know, people, um, and we we honestly still don't. I I know the Python API now fairly well, but I don't know the tool, right? Um, and uh, so you know, if uh, folks on this call want to want to get involved and have bring their ArcGIS experience, I think 
the power of the, the, the tool is, is great or GIS tools in general is great. And it's a little, you know, sort of outside the scope of the usual like programmers and things. And so that's a great place to, to if you want to join up and help supplement our abilities there, that'd be fantastic. I would happily give you a lot of work. <laughs> I mean, I mean, uh, you should help. <laughs> I wouldn't get yes. it. <laughs> <laughs> we get it. All right. Well, um, I do want to honor uh, everyone's time here and we're coming up towards the top of the hour. So um, just a couple of quick wrap up uh, things for, for the attendees. Uh, one again is obviously this was uh, hosted by Urissa, and I want to thank Wendy for uh, helping to coordinate out of headquarters. Um, we do have our Urissa Connect community for uh, Urissa members to continue conversations around these things. Um, that is a members-only community, so if you're not a member, I'll also mention that through today, June 30, uh, there's a half-price uh, joining uh, special that you can see on the membership or on the Urissa website. Um, and then just a few uh, heads up or reminders. Uh, we have the uh, Leadership Academy coming up uh, several times over the next year. Obviously with COVID, uh, we're gonna attempt our first ever virtual Leadership Academy in August. Um, I know the team's been working hard uh, on, on converting the structure and the curriculum uh, for that event. So uh, check that out on the website, as well as the GIS Pro Conference uh, this fall, which will be again held over a period of days uh, with workshops and sessions in September and October. So check those things out if you haven't already. Uh, I believe they're all open to sign up, at least the, the first two and then the forthcoming academies hopefully will be in person again, but we shall see. Um, and with that, I want to again thank you uh, both to Raylene and Adam for your presentation. Uh, this is recorded, so we will make it available on the ERISA website, and you can share it with your friends and colleagues, uh, and, and if they weren't able to make it. And with that, thank you all. Stay safe and healthy, and we'll talk to you soon.